All right, hello everyone. Um, I guess this is your first official video lesson in Calc BC, at least this year. I know you uh, had uh, some calculus at the end of your math analysis honors course last year. Um, so this is typically the way I'm gonna uh, run my lectures. Some of them will be in class, but most of them are just gonna be videos, so you can kind of do it your own time, your own pace. Um, I know you've seen a lot of this stuff at the beginning. We tend to go a little faster at the beginning of this course because you've seen all this material. We also know that you did this in the spring and it was a little bit weird in the spring, so we won't go you know, super fast. So um, just let me know if you have questions, email me, come to my office hours, and we'll get things straightened out. Um, so the first lesson is on limits. Uh, limits are a really, really important idea in calculus. They move us into derivatives, but you probably remember um, are super important. Uh, one thing, it's going to be a little bit weird because you've seen this stuff before, so just bear with me uh, and learn, learn the methods that I like and that sort of thing. So um, before we do limits, we just a little quick notation. Um, average speed, the reason we, we need limits, kind of a basic like underlying uh, understanding here is that if you think back to first grade, when you got distance equals rate times time, or third grade, or whenever it was you learned that, or the rate is equal to the distance divided by time, uh, this is just some higher level math notation. It's the same exact formula. So delta y, change in y, or change in position, y being the position. Um, so this would be f of x2 would be the second position. f of x1 would be the first position. The difference between those two is the total distance traveled, or your little d. And then x2 is the first, second time, x1 is the first time. Um, so your change in x is your change in time. Um, if you're traveling in a car and you're trying to find the average speed between these two points, we can do, use this little formula. But if you want to be more specific and know, hey, mom, how fast was I going at a certain time? That gets a little tricky, right? Hence the term limits. Um, if I know the average speed between this point and this point, it doesn't really help me with instantaneous speed at that point could be going any any rate. But if we get closer, it's more likely they'll be like closer to each other, closer, 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 hence the term uh, limit. Um, I changed the notation on you a little bit, but it's the same basic uh, idea where uh, f of x plus h is your second position. So h is the change in position now. f of x, or change in time, sorry. f of x is your... Uh, initial position. H is the total time. So if H is get, oh, that should be the H approaches zero there. Sorry about that. Is that gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, we get closer and closer and closer. That's the idea of the limit. But the question is, how do you evaluate this, right? So today's lesson is just a quick reminder of how you evaluate limits. You may remember problems like this from last year. I'll give you a nice little basic one. Limits X approaches 2 of 2X squared plus 3X. Um, if you did this, if if I was in a real class right now, I'd probably pause for a second. Hey, anyone remember how to do this? Uh, it's probably worth your time if you pause the video a second and see if you can do it before I tell you. But I'm going to keep talking. Um, but this is the simplest type of limit. You just plug that 2 in. You get 2 squared is 4. 4 times 2 is 8. So you get 8 plus 6 is uh, 14. And you'd be right. So let's talk about... Um, how we do some things. This is the most basic type of limit. So these are just some properties of limits. They're not really properties you need to know um, because you're going to use them anyway without even thinking about it. You just used actually one, two, I think three different properties in the problem I just did there without even thinking about it. But it's important that you understand that uh, math has some you know, underlying basics that make everything work as you move up the ladder, so to speak. Uh, sometimes they're um, super, super important, and we have to understand them. Other times we just know that they work and we're using them. So let's say you have uh, two, two functions. We'll call one f and one g. One has a limit of l and one has a limit of m. What we're going to do is just talk about how to combine these limits. So the first combination uh, simply just says that if you want to add f plus g and find that limit, it's the same thing as finding each limit separately. So find the one of f, find the one of g. And which in essence is just going to be L plus M. It's what I did down here on this problem, right? The limit as X approaches 2 of 2X squared is 8. The limit as X approaches 3X is 6. I just added those together. I just did them separately, which you would have done anyway without this theorem, I'm pretty sure. Um, but like I said, all math has foundations that help as we go. Subtraction would give you the same. So if there were a minus sign in there, it would be 8 minus 6, be uh, 2. You can multiply them together also. 
So if I did 2x squared times 3x, I could do each limit separately. I could also multiply the functions together. I'm going to get the same answer. These are all basically saying nothing tricky is going to happen. Exactly what you expected to happen would happen, and you're just going to use them uh, anyway. You can factor out a constant if you want. Some people like to uh, factor out that too. Others don't. This will become a little bit more important in um, derivatives. This is the same as 2 times the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared. So we can just something you'd probably do without even thinking about it again. The fifth one is probably the most important one. Um, it allows us to divide also as long as m is not 0, because now you're dividing by 0. Now you got all kinds of trouble, so we'll talk about that one in uh, just a bit. It also says you can take powers and rational exponents. Notice I did the x squared, but I could do that separately. Again, you don't really need to know any of these limits per se. No one's going to ask you what their name, what they're called, how to use them. It's just that when you're doing limits, you're using these theorems, so it's important to understand that you're actually using them. So um, back here, I did this uh, problem uh, where I just plugged the number in. So I want to just give you the first real kind of important theorem that says if a function is a polynomial function, that the limit as x approaches c of the function is just equal to the functional value at c. In other words, if I have a little function here, we'll call this f of x, and I got this point c. Uh, remember the idea of limit, just as a quick review, is what's happening to y as x gets closer and closer and closer to c. So if you remember maybe doing this, as we get closer and closer to c, what's happening to y? And basically, we're approaching that point, right? And if it's a polynomial and there's no asymptotes, there's no holes, there's nothing weird happening, the limit is just the point, right? So you can just plug it in. It allows us to do that, and we did that without even thinking on that problem, uh, more than likely. Um, it also works for rational functions. So you can take two polynomials, divide it, and do the same thing and just plug it in. However, same deal, right? If the denominator is equal to 0, then we got a problem. Um, and that's where things really started to work last year. So let me remind you of maybe when we did last year. So I'm going to go limit as x approaches negative 2 this time. And we're going to go x squared plus 5x plus 6 all over x plus 2. So first things first, whenever you're doing a limit, they're going to get more complicated than the ones I just gave you. Whenever you're doing a limit, the first thing you want to do is just try to plug in the number. If you plug in the number, you get an answer, boom, voila, you're done, nothing more to do. However, realistically speaking, that's not going to work very often because that's just too easy. But keep trying it because every time it does work, it's going to make your life a lot easier. So if you try to plug this in right now, you get negative 2 squared is 4. 5 times 2 is minus 10 plus 6 over 0. And so you get um, 0 over 0. Yeah. All right. So we got a problem with that 0, right? Um, Again, at this point, if this were a real class, I'd pause for a second. I'd say, hey, anyone remember what to do? So you might want to see if you remember what to do. Um, so the idea here is that if g of c is equal to 0, we need other ways to do this. So now's the time where I'd come back and say, hey, this is what you probably would have done last year. You say uh, x, you'd factor this top. It's x plus 2 times x plus 3. And you go x plus 2 on the bottom. That cancels out. And now you got the limit as x approaches negative 2 of x plus 3. And now you plug that negative 2 back in. Negative 2 plus 3 is your 1. And that's the answer to the limit question. If you remember, we'll talk more about this later, there's actually a hole in the graph uh, at that point, negative 2 for x and 1 for y. So if we were to graph this at negative 2, 1, there'd be a hole, okay, and there'd be other stuff going on uh, like that. So that's one possible way. So I'm just going to um, give you some reminders here. I'm not going to give you any more examples. I'm going to let you try some more on the homework. But factoring is one thing you do. Reducing reduces out some the common factors, can always help. Uh, sometimes multiplying by the conjugate of the denominator. That's another thing you probably did in the spring would help. Conjugate of a plus b is a minus b. That can be very helpful. So uh, you might want to remember that. Um, there are other things you can do that we call it kind of like more a little bit of like brute force. You can graph, you can draw pictures, you can draw tables. I'm going to tell you you don't want to do any of that in this class, not yet. That's just brute force. Um, 
it's kind of a last resort. And the problems that we're really going to deal with, you shouldn't have to um, do that. Give me a second to get a little bit of room here. Uh, but that's just kind of brute force. So um, this is one that you got last year. Limit is x approaches zero of sine x over x. If you just plug it in, you get zero over zero. But there's no tricks. You can't multiply by the conjugate. You can't factor. Um, so one thing you could do on here is try to do a table. And what I mean by table, don't do this though. You never really want to do this in this class. And by the way, calculators are not something you should be using at the beginning at all. So if you feel you need a calculator, you're doing something right. You don't want to draw a picture of it. There should be other ways to do that. Now, there is no other way to do this. I'm just going to tell you this limit. But maybe last year you did it. I don't really know. But you could do a table. So you could plug in like a 1, 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001, or either negative 0 0.001, negative 0 0.01, negative 1, those sort of things. And you could just look for a pattern. Okay, That's what, that's what I mean by drawing a table. But that's not something you should have to do. You may remember the answer to this is one. And you can do that by maybe drawing a picture or looking at a, at a, at a table. But this is actually a, one that you should know. It's going to come up a lot. The limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x is 1. Oops. And this one. Sorry, that's a little bit in the way. Let me get rid of that for you. Let me go back so you can just have this as 1. And this one's actually equal to 0. If you plug it in, you're going to get 0 over 0 again, but that's equal to 0. So these are just two that you should probably just know um, and be able to deal with. OK? All right. Um, two last things then. The next one is called the greatest integer function. So you might just see this. Um, there's lots of different notations for this function. They're all the three notations I have up here all basically are telling you the same thing. This is the, the double bracket, uh, y equals bracket in x, integer x. Sometimes they just have the lower end of the brackets. This is called the greatest integer function. Um, it's also called the step function. I'll tell you why in a second. So what this function is, is it's the greatest integer less than or equal to x. So if I said, hey, what's that? So it's the greatest integer less than or equal to 3.1. That's going to be 3. If I said y equals just 3, the greatest integer less than or equal to 3 is 3. If I said negative 2.2, remember it's got to be less than the number in there or equal to, so we can't go to negative 2 because that's greater. So this is going to be negative 3. Okay, I'm going to draw you a little quick picture. And you'll see why it's also called a step function. One, two, three, four, one, two. Three. If you were to graph this, I'm going to graph this quick because I know I'm getting a little long on this lesson. Um, it would look like this. Let me put a little different color on here. Everything between 0 and 1 would give you a 0. Closed circle on the left, open circle on the right. Everything between 1 and 2, same thing. Between 2 and 3, oh, open circle there, same thing, and so on. Hence, it's called a step function. Now, if I ask this question, like what's the limit as x approaches 2 of the greatest integer less than or equal to x, we go to 2, 1, 2, and we have a little bit of an issue here. Notice as we're approaching 2 from this side, we're at 1. But as we approach it from this side, we're at 2. Okay, So we're going to talk about what's called a one-sided limit, a one-sided limit next. Remember that. So this is a step function. It's the most common kind of weird function that you see um, a little bit. So let's talk about a one-sided limit, and then I'll be done. So sometimes we ask only what's happening from one side. So if you can see on this problem here, let me blow it up a little bit for you so you can see it better. What I have is a, what's called a piecewise function. It looks a little bit like the step function in some ways. It's doing one different thing on the right than it is on the left, but it's also got a point in the middle. And this is C. Um, so we're at the point C, and then I got three different y values. This point right here is D, that's B, and that's A. So notice I can ask three different questions. I can ask this question, which is what's the limit as x approaches C from the positive side, means from the right side. So here's C. I want to know what's happening as I approach it from the right side, the positive side. So I look at my picture. Here's the right side right here. So I'm approaching this value of A. It doesn't matter that the hole's there at all, because I'm not asking what's happening at C. I'm asking what's happening as we get closer and closer to C from the positive side. So it's approaching A. 
And then the next question is from the negative side, or C from, from minus from the negative side. So now I'm on this part here. I get closer and closer and closer to C. I'm getting closer and closer and closer to D. So like the step function, if we go back to the step function here, if we are approaching from the left side, we're here, so we're approaching one. And if we're approaching from the right side, we're here, we're approaching two. And then the last question, back to the end, is what's the x approaches C? In order for there to be an answer to this question ever, at any time, the two one side limits must be the same. So I don't have to look at the picture. I don't have to do anything. I just, hey, the limit from the right is A. The limit from the left is D. So the limit, we say, does not exist. D and E for does not exist. These two things have to be the same. I don't have to look at the picture. If these are the same, if they were A and A, then my answer here would be A. If they're not, we get a does not exist. So anytime we are asking for a limit question, it has to be the same from both sides. So if I just ask you this question alone by itself, from as X approaches C, you would just say does not exist. All right, I think that's it for section 2.1. Uh, good luck with that homework. Please let me know if you have any questions at all. I'll see you. Uh, there'll be another assignment, I think, 2.2 also before I see you next. And we'll uh, catch up when we see each other in class the next time. Uh, good luck and let me know if there's any questions.